So what are we talking about tonight? Well, we're talking about Module 4 and loops. So we're going to get loopy tonight. Last week, we learned about how to make a decision, how we communicate through Python to the computer so it can make a decision. Tonight is an extension of that. Those loops are, in fact, still a conditional statement. So first thing I'm going to talk about is one of my favorite subjects, code reusability. What do I mean by that? Code reusability is the ability to have to write less code because you write your code in such a way where you can reuse it. So um, loops are the first way to do that. Now, why is code reusability so important? Code reusability is important because it reduces the amount of code that you have to write and maintain. Now, for me, I'm not altruistic. I get paid for my work. So the company that I work for wants me to be effective and efficient with my time and wants the code to be effective, high quality, and maintainable. And one of the basic ways you do that is learning how to reuse your code. So this is the first part. You will hear me talk about reusability a lot. Um, it is one of my favorite topics. So that's what we're talking about with code reusability. Less code, easier to maintain, often higher quality, much less likely to be spaghetti code. So what is a loop? Well, a loop is a way to repeat the same thing again and again and again, without having to write the code again and again and again. In Python, there are two types of loop. There's a for loop and a while loop. The while loop requires a sentinel value, and I'll tell you what that is in just a minute. And it's really best when you have user input that's going to change the condition of the loop. It's going to change the outcome of that decision. Um, think your program. The main loop of your game will be a while loop with a sentinel value on the outside and that value being changed on the inside. So. When I'm talking about while loops, it's time to start putting that in the context of the game. A for loop is best for when you have a sequence of things. You either know that you want to count to the number 10, or you've got a list, or you've got a string that you're going to evaluate all the characters for, which, we will, which will happen in one of the labs. So for loop is best for a sequence. So this is a while loop, OK? The basics of a while loop are is you have a sentinel value. Oh, sorry, first, while is a key word. It tells Python that it is about to start making decisions repeatedly until the exit condition is reached, OK? While loop, just like if statements, because it's a conditional, has a block of code underneath it that's indented. So if statements have blocks of code that are indented, while loops are conditional, so they have blocks of code that are indented. We always start with a sentinel value. The sentinel value, it's just a variable. They call it a sentinel value because it sounds good. It's just a variable that you have to define outside the loop. And right here, I called it sentinel so it was clear. OK? The sentinel value is defined outside the loop. It is used as the test for the condition of the loop. And then it's often modified inside the loop. So these three sentinels are, in fact, changing the same memory space in Python. So. A variable must be defined outside the loop. I just said that. And a while is always a conditional statement. You use Boolean operators. You use relational operators in loops. So they are conditional statements, which means they can only have a true or false answer. Just like last week, everything either had to be true or false. 
because computers aren't smart. They only know one of two things, on or off. Like I said, it's a dimmer. It's not a dimmer switch. It's an on or off switch. Same thing with loops. You're going to use the same conditional relational operators that you used last week. So to, the way to read this line of code, the way to read the while line is Sentinel is not equal to Q. If true, keep going, else stop. That's really how you read that one line of code. So a rule, a sentinel value is a variable which, which must be defined outside the loop. And Q is the exing condition. When the sentinel equals Q, then the processing will stop. And it won't stop until then. A while loop will execute until the sentinel value reaches the exit condition. Now Q is the exit condition in this case. Like all, while st like all conditional statements, while must end with a colon. So it's the same as when you have if, elif, and else. Got to end with a colon because it's a conditional statement. I know there's a whole lot going on here. And we're going to go deeper into while loops. So here's just an example of following the sentinel. So our friendly neighborhood person at the computer is Professor Lisa. And she's going to be adding a little bit of code here. So first of all, we have a sentinel. It's equal to go. And then the while loop is, while the sentinel is not equal to Q, do something. That's one thing I didn't mention on the last side. The sentinel value to enter the loop cannot be the same as the test condition. Because if sentinel here were Q, you would never actually make it into the body of the loop. So the first thing that happened is the while is um, evaluated and go is not the same as Q. So we're going to print you and we're just going to print out something. Then we're going to go down and the sentinel value is going to be set equal to the input that some user is going to put in. And so here, your friendly neighborhood professor Lisa is going to input hello and we're going to go Okay, input hello. And we're going to go back up to the top of the loop. So the while statement is when I say top of the loop, that's the while statement. So we know that sentinel is now equal to hello. Hello is not the same as Q. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Oh. So iteration is complete. Can everybody please mute? So the first iteration. I'm sorry, an iteration is one trip through the loop. So the first iteration is done because we've taken one trip through the loop. Hello is not the same as Q. So the sentinel is now hello, which is not the same as Q. So we're going to execute the code inside the while loop. So Professor Lisa is still testing your code. So she's going to put Q in for quit because that's one of the conditions and then up we go it's q iteration two is complete the sentinel is q so stop so we're not going to do anything else because i put q in as the sentinel each trip trip through the while loop is called an iteration an iteration is one trip through the loop. I know that's probably redundant. Okay, so let's look at a flow chart for a while loop. And we're going to contrast this in a little bit with a flow chart for a for loop. So we start. We have our sentinel value, which we said equal to go. We have the question. You'll notice there's no while on here. I'm not using the word while in this. Uh, flowchart because I, w I don't have to and I shouldn't. So I'm just going to ask the question, is sentinel not equal to Q? False. If that's false, then I output sentinel. I then input the sentinel value. 
I go back to if sentinel is Q. That's what gives you the loop in a flowchart. You don't use while, you don't use for, you will see that this is the loop. And then if sentinel is Q, I stop. So that is how you create a loop in a flowchart. And it looks just like that. It's just a round robin. Now in a little bit we're going to see some more complex ones um, and some for loops with inner for loops. But for right now, this is when you're dealing with a flowchart, because you are going to have to deal with flowcharts later on, this is how you do a loop. Okay, so now we're going to follow the sentinel value again in the flowchart. So I start, my sentinel value is go, is sentinel, if sentinel is not Q, well, sentinel is not Q. Oh, I have that wrong, that should be true. My bad. I will change that before I put these up. Um, if sentinel is not equal to Q, then we're going to output sentinel. We're going to input sentinel. Professor Lisa is sitting there testing your code. She's going to input hello. And then it's going to go back and it's going to say, is hello the same as sentinel? No. Or is hello not equal to sentinel? That's true. So I'm going to change that before I put this up. So then I'm going to put in Q. And since I put in Q, I'm going sentinel is now equal to Q. So I'm going to change this real quick because I'm not happy with myself for getting those backwards. Okay. This is the correct order, just like this is the correct order. I apologize for that. Okay. So, that's been corrected. Okay, so we're going to stop real quick. And, oh, sorry, I've got some chats going on. I don't understand how a while loop works. Are you going to break that down? Um, sure. In if we end with print in while, we have print second and then end with other conditions to stop the loop. Could we use print last or is that wrong? You could use print last. It's not wrong. How do you use while for in pseudocode? I can show you the pseudocode in a little bit. I actually have pseudocode that will be part of the description. So I'll put up descriptions with links. And those links, one of those links will be to the pseudocode for the different labs. So let me go back. Hold on. I'm going to turn off notifications. Okay. So, Michael, I'm going to go back. Or did you get what you needed, Michael, in my description of a while loop? Put that in the chat. And if not, then we'll go back and I'll answer and I'll maybe see if I can figure out where the disconnect is. So, while, while we're waiting for that, uh, let me do this. I am going to go here and I'm going to start with a simple while loop. Kind of, it's still confusing. Okay. Um, yeah, we can, we can meet after this, Michael, and see if, if, if you still don't understand, we'll see how to get you to understand. So this is just a simple while loop. Hold on. Let's make it bigger. So, um, all I have is per power. So this is about um, just multiplying. And the user care is y. And I'm going to say if while user care is the same as y, then I'm going to print per power. I'm going to multiply it. And then I'm going to have user input for it. So this is a little bit different than the one I had in the PowerPoint slides. Instead of not being equal to, 
this one has to be equal to to enter the loop. So you can do one or the other. So let's put this one in the debugger. This is simple while. Okay. Where is it? Just had it. Simple while. Okay. So I put a breakpoint up at line one. I'm going to start the debugger. And we will see that I've got my console down here. So I'm going to step over. And I'm going to step over. So here, because it's a positive, um, not really positive, because it's, a, it's testing equality rather than inequality, to enter the loop, the user care has to be the same as Y. And I'll show you what happens if it's not in a minute. So I'm going to print out, I'm going to multiply it, and then I'm going to say input something. Well, um, right now I'm going to input no. So I'm now, I've just changed the value of user care by entering here. So now I'm going to step over the while loop. The while loop is going to evaluate um, to false, and it's going to say done. So how could I have continued that loop? Well, the way I could have continued that loop is to keep putting Y in. So we're in. We're going through the loop. Let me get the console up. So if I put in Y here, I keep going. Every time I put in Y, I keep going. As soon as I put in, let's say, N, it evaluates and I stop. So this is a conditional. In this case, I was using equality rather than inequality. So the sentinel value, which in this case is the variable user care, has to be the same to enter the loop. Otherwise, it will stop the loop. And this is another one, which is while with Sentinel. So this is much closer to what we just did. Um, this one, instead of testing for equality, tests for inequality. It uses the not equal to. So in this case, the Sentinel value, which here is the variable named answer, cannot be Q because it would if it is Q, it would be false, and we would go outside the loop. So let's take a quick look at this. And let me, I'm just trying to keep this into the hour. Let me know if I'm going too fast for you guys, and I can slow down. So this is while with Sentinel. Uh, while with Sentinel. Okay. So I have... A breakpoint at line three, so that's where I'm going to stop. So answer is Y. I'm testing inequality. So if Y is not equal to Q, then go to line six. And Y is not equal to Q, sorry, and answer is not equal Q. Y does not equal Q. So we go to line six. Okay, so we're going to say, what is the answer? Well, let's say the answer is 42. Okay, it's going to print out the answer is 42. Sorry. The answer is 42. 42 is not the same as Q, so it's going to say what is the answer. This time I'm going to put Q in, and whoops. I didn't actually put anything in. So let's do that again. What is the answer? The answer is Q. The answer is Q. So we will exit the loop. And you'll notice line 9 never got executed until I was done with the loop. Line 9 is outside the loop. We know it's outside the loop because it is left justified with that while. Okay? 
indentation says it is inside the loop and will only get executed when the condition of the loop evaluates to true. Um, what is the point of the loop? It's not a dumb question, Michael. The point of the loop is that you can run the same set of code as many times as you need to, sometimes too many times. But if you have a sequence, if you have a game, let's talk about your game right now. If you have a game and you don't know what I, as the user, am going to input, I have to be able to run that code again and again and again based on the user input until they um, un until they lose or they win. So when you're dealing with like your text-based game, I'm going to be sitting there or your teacher's going to be sitting there and they're going to be entering things in. They're going to be entering the direction. So in that, in that instance, this loop is going to be your game controller and you're going to Somebody's going to put something in, and then it's going to run through all the options and decide whether they've got the thing they need to get or whether the dragon kills them. So that's what the purpose of a loop is. You just run the same code as many times as you need to. And that that's huge. That's powerful in programming because... I don't want to repeat the same lines of code. I don't just want to copy and paste the code. It's ineffective and inefficient from a development standpoint. It is not flexible. It, you need to have code that is flexible, and loops really help with the flexibility. Um, and it reduces the maintenance. So there's just a lot of things that loops are very good for. Okay, so why print is before cur power. So, um, oh, the other one, my bad. Um, just because that's where I put it. I could have just as easily done this. Right there. So that's just where I put it. And, and I could have put it here too. It, it, that, made no difference in the working of the loop. It's just where things were printed, so it's gonna, you're going to see something different. Does that help answer the question, Bertisha? Okay, you got it. Good. So let's go back to the PowerPoint presentation and talk about counting with a while loop. Now, they introduced counting with a while loop because you can. Um, but I never use a while loop to count. I use a for loop to count. So, oops, hold on. Um, basically, you can make a loop that says while direction is north if the variable is north until the user loops enter. Yeah, basically, in, in your game, you would say while answer is not Q or is not quit. So that's the exit condition for the loop. Other than that, you're going through that loop and I'm entering north or I'm entering south or I'm saying get item. So basically that's what you're doing. So you're just going through the loop waiting for somebody to either say quit or for something in the game to have said you win or you lose. So that's the basic premise for the game and for a while loop. Okay. No problem. All right. So let's keep going. So this is a loop with a counter. So we're counting with a while loop. So in this case, our sentinel value is just going to be an integer. And in this case, I set the integer to zero. So counter is a variable. You know it's a variable. It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. What's on the right is zero, and that's my starting place when I count with a while loop. So I'm starting at zero, and I'm going to go through this loop until uh, while, excuse me, counter is less than three. The minute counter becomes three, the while loop is going to stop. So 
counter is the sentinel value, counter is zero. I uh, just let this one play, sorry. We're going to always have to increment the counter by one. If you don't increment the counter in a while loop, then what's going to happen, I probably should have slowed this down, I'm sorry, is that you're going to go forever. This line is very important right here. Oops. Sorry about that. This line is very important because if I don't increment counter, then the loop will run forever. It's called, uh, it, it's called an infinite loop, and they are possible. So let's just run through that one more time. Counter is the sentinel value. Counter is zero, so we're going in the loop. We're going to print what counter is. We're going to increment counter by one. So then we're going to go and what's going to increment to two. And we're at a third, and it's going to increment to the third, and at that point, it's going to be done because three is not less than three. Okay, so now we're going to do, sorry about the arrow. Now we're going to count with a while loop. So counter equals zero. Is counter less than three? If counter is less than three, then... Oh, I just made this really bad. I'm, I'm sorry, this is all out of whack. So this is what a loop looks like. Don't, de don't I apologize for the order of all the arrows. Okay, so oh, shoot. Let me go back. What I wanted to do was contrast this with the other one, and you'll see that basically, even when the arrows aren't in the right order, a loop is a loop in a flowchart. So we still have the same basic structure, different problems, same structure. So it's very important to remember that when you're doing your flowcharts, but also when you're thinking about loops. When you trace this out, it's a loop. Just again and again and again. Keep doing this code until something changes the condition here to be false. Okay, now we're getting into for loops. For loop is the other kind of loop, and it, for loop is the loop that I use 99% of the time. And that's because I'm dealing with data that's coming from a database, I'm dealing with sequences, all kinds of things. And for loops are better at it at sequences than anything, because you simply have to do less work. There's a lot of good structure and functions around a for loop. So for is a keyword, and it tells Python that it's going to make decisions repeatedly. Sound like a while? That's because it is like the while loop. It's just a different way to, to perform the same set of functions. So. I have num. Num is a variable. It's being defined inside the for loop. Num does not exist anywhere else in the program than what is inside this loop. Um, it can't be accessed outside of the loop. So something different than while. While, I defined a sentinel value outside before that while keyword was hit. In a for loop, I don't do that. I simply give it the name of a variable that's not anywhere else in the code, and Python will take care of setting that value. We have a keyword called in. In tells Python to accept, expect a sequence. That's what it does. The sequence can be a list. Sequence can be a string. It's some kind of a sequence. Range. Range is a special function. That, that does a lot of stuff, and we're going, I have a whole discussion on just range that we're going to go through. But for right now, remember it's a function, and the function sets the limit. Range basically says, start at, th this call, the way this range is called, it's start at zero, go to three, increment by one. All that's for just that little bit of code. So 
you read this as num is less than three, if true, keep going else, stop. It's an additional, don't forget the colon, and remember, we now have a new operator, a new kind of relational operator because of this in, okay? And that will become important, more important later when we do lists because lists are, it's great because you can just say, if this is in the list, then do something, or while these things are in the list. So we have a code block just like we did with the while loop, and it will only be executed, oh, if counter is less than three. Don't know why that was 10. Uh, the for loop defines a special variable that is only accessible inside the for loop. In this case, it's num. Range is a special function used with for loops. Like all conditional statements, a for loop statement must end in a colon. So just like the while loop, just like if, elif, and else, any of the other conditionals, you got to remember that colon. So let's talk about range and in. So in is a keyword. It has two purposes. It determines if a value is contained in a sequence or it's used to iterate through a sequence. In this case, it's used to iterate through the sequence that is created by range. You will often see in and range together in a for loop. You don't have to have in, but if you have range, generally you have in. So range is a function provided by Python. Python just gives it to us. Re range can take up to three arguments. The first argument, if it needs it, it's the start value. The second is the stop value, and the third is the increment. Start and increment are optional. So you can call this function with three arguments, two arguments, or one argument. That's what you can do. Um, what does range do? Well, it creates a sequence of numbers. Under the hood, it's creating a list of numbers that unless it's told otherwise the start place for that list is always zero it the end is always minus one for the range value so range is not inclusive of that stop value um, it increments by one unless told otherwise now this is important because maybe you want to do every other one and you use range to look at every other one. So yeah, the stop is required. So let's follow the numbers in this range. Okay, first of all, you don't need Professor Lisa because there's no user input associated with this. Okay, it's just going to run for three times. So no teacher needed right now. Num is zero. I'm going to go print num. I'm going back to the top of the loop. Num is now one. I'm going to print it back to the top of the loop. Num is two. Print it back to the top of the loop. Num is three. And I'm done. Now, if you think about what the counter was, for a while loop, how you counted with a while loop, there's a whole lot less code counting with a for loop. Let's go back and look at that really quick. Uh, that's the sentinel. That is count. This is counting with a while. You have one, two, three, four lines. And this is counting with a for loop. Yes. Okay. You can make a loop that says, I'm oh, sorry. So I, so loop is only for numbers. A for loop is not only for numbers, but it is for sequences. You can have a sequence of anything, okay? So range is for numbers, but the for loop isn't for numbers. The for loop can be over a list, and you'll see that a lot next week, and I actually have a small example of that for this week. 
So that's what I wanted to contrast. The difference between for and while for counting is two lines of code, and that adds up. Okay, no problem. So let's do a for with range here, okay? I have two lines of code. Now I say for counter in range zero to six, so I'm gonna start at zero, and I'm gonna end at one minus six, so it's gonna end at five. And I didn't have to say zero here. I could have said one, and we'll look at that in just a minute. And then I'm just gonna print things out. So I'm just gonna run it, yes. Can we use a while loop to read data from a list? Absolutely. Anything you can do with a for loop, you can do with a while loop. It's not vice versa because it's hard to change the sequence inside a for loop, but you can do it. Um, it's way, for is built for sequences and ranges. While isn't while is just much more generic and the reason I use for loop is because frankly there's less lines of code to write and maintain um, so I'm just gonna put the debugger there set up the configuration for with range and we're just going to roll through this real quick. So I'm going to set it up in the debugger. So if I go to look at variables, there's nothing in variables yet. However, when I step over this, all of a sudden you will see counter. Counter is defined the first time I hit that for loop. It's not defined anywhere else. So it's a special kind of variable that you can't just use anywhere. So I'm going to print. Counter is zero. Let's go back to variables. I'm now at the four line again. As soon as I step over, you're going to see counter is now one. And then I'm going to go and counter is going to be two. So I'm not adding anything here. The range function is doing it for me. And we do five. I'm up at five. Counter is six. And it stops. So the range is up to the last number, but not the last number. Correct. Absolutely correct. It is not inclusive of that last number. So, oh, one thing I want to do before we go on. There are some very um, frustrating things that can happen with for loops and ranges and sequences. You can walk off the end of a list. The minute you do that, Python's going to say something very unhappy. So, um, this is just, I have a list that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It could have been anything. I have a variable that I'm going to create in the loop, and it's going to be called index, and my range is going to go to 9. So, what am I doing? Well, I'm saying my list of whatever my index value is, is, and then I'm doing my list of index. Well, I have a range of 9 here, which means it's going to go to 8, but I only have 7 things here. So what's going to happen? Let's go. Okay. Can you change the increment of the range function from plus 1 to plus 5? Yes. It doesn't have to be 1. It could have been 5. We can go back and look at that real quick in just a minute. We're we're about to experience what they call an index an index out of bounds exception. So we're just going to run this. Hold on. Get to that index out of bounds. This is a very common problem. So I'm just going to run this right now, and you see it printed one two three four five six seven, and then all of a sudden. I got list index out of range. And that's because I walked off the end of the list. I said go to 8. So there should have been 8 things in that list. But there were only, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things in the list, starting with zero, ending at seven. There wasn't a seven. There there wasn't an index of eight. So Python says, sorry. So how do I change this so it's right? Well, I want to change it to seven. Because remember, it's minus one. So that seven is not inclusive. And by changing that, my code works. So if I put this back even to eight, my code isn't going to work. I'm going to get the index out of range. So that's something to be careful about. Python's not going to save you from yourself. If this number is too big, it's just going to give you an index. So if you get this, you know that you've walked off the end of the list, and you have to figure out why this range isn't behaving the way you wanted it. So the question from Nathan was, could I increment by 5? Yes, I could have incremented by 5. So let's just do this. And we're actually going to go through an example of this in a minute. Let's say that the range is 1, my stop is 20, and I'm going to increment it by 5. So let's do forward range again. forward range. Okay. So I'm just going to run this real quick. Can we use len function instead of hard coding? Absolutely. Absolutely. Very good question, MD. And we can go back and change it. No problem. Good job. Okay. So I'm just going to run this. And we're going to see that it went 1, 6, 11, and 16 because I told it to increment by 5. I started at 1, not at 0. Said you can't go past 20. Actually, you can't go past, yeah. If you get to 20, you're done. And I'm incrementing it by 5. I could just simply change that to increment it by 4. I can run it again, and we'll get a different set of answers because I changed the increment. So, and we're actually going to go through what I just talked about in just a minute. So here's a flow chart, which is your visual tool, with a for loop. Now, if you look at this, this doesn't look that much different from the while loop. In fact, I'd argue that it's not any different from the while loop, and that is the way it should be. Flow charts are language agnostic. They don't care about fours. They don't care about whiles. They care about the structure of the loop and how you're going to, what you're going to do in the loop and how you're going to get out of it. Don't ever forget the how you're going to get out of it part. Because if not, you could have a loop that runs forever. Um, yes, the shapes matter. Shapes definitely matter in flowcharts. The length, you know, the while and else doesn't, but this is start and end are always circular or I make them oblong. This is input and output, that, that rectangle on an angle. These are decisions, and we'll see processes in a minute. I'll show you Joseph in processes in just a minute. I promise we're going to get to one of those. So just to notice, while in for loops, you can't tell the difference in a flowchart. So it's only when you get to implementation, because flowchart's a design tool, it's when you get to implementation, you'll make the decision of what the best tool in the language is. So let's talk a little bit more about ranges. So, whoops, I don't know why that's there. My bad. So we're going to play. All right, now we're going to do it. So this is print every number between 1 and 5 inclusive. So what do I mean by inclusive? I want it to make sure that it's going to print out the 5 at the end. So I make sure that my stop value is 6. So my start number is 1, exact same thing, num is 1. 
So 1 plus 2 is 3, so that's the next thing that I'm going to print out, and we know it's an increment. So there's the increment. Num is 3. 3 plus 2 equals 5. That's the increment. Num is now 5. I'm going to print out 5. Num is 7, and the loop will be done. So that's just a little bit about what we were doing um, in the program that we just did. Oops, keep doing that. Okay. Where am I? Okay. Alrighty. Yes. Sorry about that. Okay. What about processing? Okay, gotcha. Would you implement the len? How would you implement the len function as mentioned earlier? Okay, so let me go back and change this index out of bounds dot py. And instead of saying range 8, I'm going to say the range is the length of my list. So let's see what happens just by changing that. Index out of bounds. So this is the length of my list, whatever my list is. And I'm just going to run it. And one, two, three, four, no index out of bounds. What happens if I take away the seven and I run it? No index out of bounds because I'm using, as MD suggested, the length of the list. And I can add stuff to it. And you'll see that even when I added a string, it didn't give me any problems because that's just another element in the list. Yes, it's very cool. So. Len is your friend. So now we're going to talk about nested loops. So we've talked about single loops, but you can have a loop inside of a loop. And this is just challenge 4.13. I like to use it because it's clean and simple, but it shows you what's happening in a nested loop. So what is a nested loop? It is a loop inside of another loop. And I nest loops all the time. Later on in the class, you're going to have something that deals with a comma separated value file. And you're going to be using nested loops for that. So why would I want a nested loop? Well, one of the classic examples is a matrix. It's, you know, it's a number of rows and a number of columns. And so the um, the way we do this is simple. The for loop, a for loop, is just inside of another for loop. So, and I, I I name the variables outer and inner so we always know. That's just me. So I have an outer for loop that's going to test the number of rows, and I have an inner loop which is going to test the number of columns. And let's run through this, and I think it will become clearer. So we have our happy teacher down there, and she's going to say there's two rows and two columns. And I'm going to say outer equals zero. So the next thing I do is I go to the next line of code, and the next line of code is another for loop. So inner is now zero. I'm going to print a star. And then I'm going to return to the top of the inner loop. The inner loop isn't finished. And I don't go back to the outer loop until the inner loop is finished. So in my inner, inner is 1 now because I've just incremented. Range has incremented it by 1 for me. And I'm going to print another star. I'm going to go back to the top of the inner loop, 
that's going to be 2, and range is not inclusive, so it's going to then go and print a new line. So this print statement is left justified with that 4, inner 4, and it's indented 1 from the outer for loop. I know there's a lot of 4s going on here. So it's going to print a new line. And then, and only then, do we go back up to the top of the loop. So now, outer is now 1. I then go back into the inner loop, which starts out at 0 again. I'm going to print out another star. I'm going to go back up to the top of the inner loop. Where did that go? Okay, I'm printing another star. I'm done with that. The for loop, oh, my lines aren't there. There it is. The for, inner for loop is ended, so I go to the next line of code to execute, and that is that print statement. And then I go up to the top of the loop, and I say, outer equals 1 plus 1, which is 2, and so we're done. So that is an inner, uh, that is a nested loop. And it's very important to understand the behavior of that nested loop, when something happens and when it doesn't happen. So let's go and look at a little bit of code. Oh, no, no problem. So uh, nested for. Okay, this is just a nested for loop. And I'm going to input some value. It's going to go from zero to value. And I'm going to print the outer number. And then I'm going to print all the inner numbers. And, and actually, let's do this. Let's do val1, and let's do val2. We'll just change this up a bit. Two. And I'm going to put a space here. And then I'm going to make this one. There we go. I, I didn't know how to spell that. Okay. So I changed it up a bit because I want it to be more like what that other problem was. So I'm going to do nested for loop. And we're going to walk through this in the code. All right. So I'm just going to put my breakpoint there. I'm going to do it in the debugger. It's asking me to input a number. Okay. So, whoops, what did I do? Let's try this again. I think it was just something I did. Console, step over. Input a number. I'm going to input three. Step over. Input another number. I'm going to input four. So now let's go through the loop. Watch. Let's watch what the, how the values change. So outer is going to be zero. I'm just going to print zero. Inner is going to be zero. And I'm going to Print 0 with a space, and then inner is 1, inner is 2, inner is 3. Now, val2 is 4, so at this point, we're going to not go inside the loop, because it's going to change to 4, and we're going to go back to the next executable line of code, which is finished in outer iteration. So now I am back up to the top of the outer loop. So 
my outer number is now going to change. It hasn't changed yet. It's still at zero. Even though I've done all that work, it's still at zero. So outer is now one. I'm going to print outer. Now I'm going to go back in the inner loop. Now remember, inner is a brand new variable at this moment, according to what Python thinks. So it's going to start out again at zero. It's going to print inner again. Just one, two, three, and now it's done. It's going to say finished with the outer iteration. I'm now up at outer. Outer is going to change to two. I'm going to print two. Then I'm going to run through this again. So we get to four. We're finished with outer. We're up at the top. Range is going to change, outer is going to change to three, and we're done. So that is a nested for loop in action. So you can see that there's a lot of work going on inside that inner loop when the outer loop is just hanging out. So that is, and this is similar to a problem you're going to have tonight for your lab. Um, so when they're talking about printing out, you know, a triangle of characters, you're going to use nested loops. Okay, so we're going to add a couple of, we're going to add a little complexity now. So we have while loops, for loops, nested loops, and you can nest a while loop too, by the way. I just don't have an example, probably because I don't do it that much. Um, we have two new keywords, break and you. These are there specifically to control the actions of a loop. Break is a keyword and it means stop. Just exit whatever loop you're in. Continue is a keyword, but it means stop what you're doing and go back to the top of the loop. So they're two, they're both used to control the flow of a loop. However, they have different uses. One is stop at all costs, that's break. Continue is don't do any more and go up to the top of the loop. Now, for your game, I'm pretty sure you're going to be using continue. But break is important too. So let's take a quick look at what break is. So now I've just got a while loop. Um, yeah, that stuff shouldn't have all been there. I'm sorry. So I've got a while loop, I've got a sentinel value, I'm going to put the sentinel value in and I'm going to go through this, very similar, except when I get the right answer, I'm going to break. So, oh, that's why it was all there, because I wasn't playing it. So, the handy dandy teacher's there, so sentinel is set at a space or at nothing. Sentinel is not done, so I'm going to ask if there's input, so what is the answer is 42. Well, time is not in Sentinel because Sentinel is 42. So that's the false. So now, this is an elif, so it says it's 42 in Sentinel. Yeah, 42 is in Sentinel. Actually, that needed to be a quote. I'm sorry. So I'm going to print the right answer, and I'm going to break. When I break, I go to the next executable line of code outside the while loop. And that is this print statement. I'm going to print done, sorry, and I'm finished. So that's how a break works. And let me fix this right here so that when you guys see it, it's right. So that is how break works. At the point that it hits the break, it goes to the next executable line of code, which means that's outside the loop. And in this case, that's print. Print is left justified with while. And so it is outside the loop. Now let's look at continue. Continue, I what I have here is I just have a sequence. So I've got my stirs one and two and three. And I'm going to split that into a list, and then we're going to run through that list. 
Sorry. Just saw something. There. Okay. So let's play this. So I got my list. I'm going to split it. And that's what it's going to look like. It's going to be one and two and three and four. It's just a list. We're going to learn a lot more about those next week. So I'm going into a for loop and I'm defining a variable called range. And sorry, defined a variable called item. And the range is going to be the length of my list. So item is one. And I'm going to say if item is the same as and, I'm going to continue. Right now it's not. So I'm going to print item with a comma and end. And I go back up to the top of the loop. Now my item is and. So is item and yes? So we're going to continue. And then that takes me up to the top of the loop. Whereas break took you out of the loop, continue just says keep on going, don't test anything else before. Same with two. Two is not and, so it's going to print the item. It's going to go back to the top of the loop. We now have an and again. So yes. We're going to then continue because we don't want to print anything with the word and in it. So now we have three. That all goes away. Three is not an and. We print and we go back to the top of the loop and we're done. i got to get my arrows right. So that is break and continue. Uh, now I was going to go into the labs. Does anybody have any questions before I do that? I know I've thrown a lot of stuff at you tonight in the last hour. Nope. Okay. So let's go back and talk about, oh, sorry. What about the process? Sorry. Okay. I am going to show you process. Is there a process in these? Yes, there's definitely process in this one. So I'll show you process, talk to more about process when we get here. So lab 4.14, it's given a line of text as input, output the number of characters excluding spaces, periods, or commas. So this is the flowchart. And I can actually also bring up the pseudocode if you want, but that will also be linked on with the video. So basically, we're just starting. We're going to input a string. We're going to have some character count equals zero. Now, this doesn't necessarily indicate that it should be a while. Now I'm going to say if less than the length of the string, if it's true, I'm going to check the characters. If it's not uh, a space or a period or a, I should have put LF, sorry, um, a comma, then we're going to, um, yeah, sorry. Then we're going to do counter equals counter plus one. And if it's false, then we're going to go back and we're going to look at the next value of the string. Only when we have finished the value of the string doesn't mean we're going to output the counter and end. Now, actually, I think I'm going to pull up the pseudocode for this one, 4.14. Okay, so here's the pseudocode, and it might be a little bit easier to understand. Um, so what I basically have here is I have a for loop. That's completely okay in the pseudocode. And I'm saying if character is not equal, sorry, what's going on? I think so. I've been doing Python 2 for a long time, and I can never remember the rules about whether they have 
the shortcut plus plus. Give it a try. If your Python interpreter doesn't like it, go back to counter equals counter plus one. So here is the pseudocode, and basically one of the things I show you on the pseudocode is that you can just use the AND operator um, for that if statement. You don't have to have three separate if statements. So, and there, here's a little bit of um, help about where things should be indented. So the for loop is left justified, the if statement is indented one, and the set is indented two. And then output is outside the loop, so there's no indent at all. So here's your process. 4.15 is a much more complex problem than we've seen. So what are they asking us to do? Well, you're going to create a password for a user. You're going to take in a simple word, and you're going to make it stronger by doing character replacements, or basically creating a new string every time you have to substitute a character. So we're going to input a word. We're going to set counter equals to zero again that doesn't necessarily indicate a while loop. We're going to set password equal to nothing because password is what's going to be the outcome. So I check something. Is counter less than the length of the word? If, if it's true, then we're going to go and we're going to test all this stuff. If it's false, we're going to output the password and we're done. So if, if there are still more letters left to evaluate in the password, then I'm going to say is word of counter equal to an I. Is it the same as a lowercase i? If so, the process is password plus equal exclamation point. So whatever was in that password, I'm now going to add an exclamation point. If not, I'm going to check to see if that that letter is an A. If so, I'm going to I'm going to use um, I'm going to use the at sign and add that to the password. If it's lowercase m, oh, I think that was uppercase. My bad. Lowercase m is going to be uppercase. Let me get that right. If it's B, it's going to become an 8, and if it's O, it's going to become a dot. And if all of those, you know, if none of those matter, let's say it's a Z, then you fall down here and you just add that counter, that, that letter in the word. And then when you're all done, you go back up to the top of the loop. So this is still a loop. It's just a very complex loop because you are going... You can follow it all the way down and back up and around. So, and some of it's just because, you know, I've only got so much screen real estate. So that is what Lab 1.5, 4.15 does. And it is just a lot of, there's a, a loop, a single loop. You don't have to have nested loops for this. And you're going inside that loop to doing, to, do a lot of if and elif and l and one l statement. So 4.16, oddly enough, has a lot more words, but it isn't more complex than 4.15. Okay, so this time you're going to output a right triangle based on the user specified height and and a symbol. So this is going to be a nested loop. You're going to input a character, you're going to input the height, you're going to start counter at 1, and if counter less than height, then you're going to have an enter counter at 1, and um, if enter counter is less than counter, so this is counter, this is inner. So this would indicate that this is a for loop, a nested for loop. So this would be the outer, this would be the inner, and if it's true, you're going to output the character. You're going to increment inner. If it's a 
for loop. You don't have to do that mechanically. And then you're going to go back up to the top of the loop, and there's the internal loop right there. Okay? When you're done, when inner is no longer less than counter, that's false. So you're going to say counter equal counter plus one. You're going to output a new line, and you're going to go up to the top of the loop. My bad. That's completely wrong. Okay, you're going to go up to the top of that loop. No. That doesn't belong there. Um, I apologize. I should have gone over this more. Okay, now let's do it. If it's false, you're going to increment counter. You're going to output a new line. You're going to go back up to the top of the outer, of the outer loop. Again, it's true, inner, you go around inner when it's false, and that's what you do until you're done, until counter is no longer less than or equal to height. And then here, these are just the Mad Libs. People get confused about this, but it's a single loop. You're waiting for someone, something to not be quit, and you're just going to output what Zybooks asks you to output, you're going to input words, you're going to split them up, you're going to print them out, and that's just what you're going to do. So does anybody have any questions? I'm going to say going once. Okay. Let me know what your question is, Danielle. And nobody has to stay if they don't want to. I'm kind of done with the whole lecture part, and this stuff will go up tomorrow. I do not do uh, tutoring, Michael. But the school does have some good tutors. They have some very good tutors. No problem. Thanks for asking. The fourth reassignment in Brightspace. Okay, let's go take a quick look at that. Let me get on here. Okay, Brightspace. Learning modules. Okay, so. 4.3, pseudocode revisited. Let's go look at the rubric for the assignment. The rubric has everything you need to know. So basically, this is called a high-low game sample output. So you're going to review that, and what they want you to do is um, they want you to consider the questions, when would be a good time to use an if-else, and then I want you to create pseudocode that logically outlines each step of the game program so that it meets the following functionality. Prompts the user for input, generates a random number, that's just, you know, generate random number. Prompts the user to input a guess between the lower and upper numbers. So this is an input statement. This is a process, it's just doing something. This is another input statement, and you're going to want to ask them, you know, input it between the upper and lower bounds. You're going to output a statement based on the guess, and then um, what should the output be if the guess is too low? What, if, what should it be if it's too high? And what to, if the guess is right? And then it loops until the guess until they guess the correct number. So that's what they want you to do. They want you to do pseudocode for a loop. And inside that loop things are going to be changing. So you're going to input a lower bound and an upper bound. And then you're going to generate a random number between the lower and upper bounds. That random number is the right number. Then um, you're going to go through 
and you're going to output a statement based on the user's guess. So the guess, the user, after you generate the random number, the user is going to go through and they're going to input a number. Let's say you set your upper bound was one and, sorry, your lower bound was one and your upper bound was 10. You're going to say, give me a number between one and 10. And then if they give you seven, but the random number was five, you're going to say, oh, that, your guess was too high. Or if you guess three and the random number was five, you're going to say, oh, your guess was too low. And then you're going to ask them to put in another number until they get to seven or until they get to five. And at which point you're like, yippee, you made it to five. And then you end the loop. Does that help some? Okay. So I would take a look. Um, um, I would say loop, and I would use if. I would not say while or for. I would just say loop. And you do want to use if, else, and elif. Or actually, you would do if, then, if, then, if, then in the pseudocode. And I think they have, let me go back, was that not, in, in module three, uh, they talk about that, um, the guide to pseudocode. Oops. Why is that like that? Why did it go all the way down? There we go. Um, oh. Uh, yes, the process is a rectangle. Do you mean for the flowchart, Joseph? Oh, it failed to load the file. Sorry, Michael. Um, so the process is just a rectangle. So did you want to see the pseudocode for something, Joseph? The pseudocode, too, for the assignment. I don't know that uh, free conference call is going to let you upload anything, Michael. But there are good, um, in Module 3, the school does provide guidance. So if you're worried about if and else, this is what it's telling you to do for a while condition or a for loop. So I was wrong. You do want to use for and end for. So this is the syntax for the while loop, okay? Uh, sorry, for the... Uh, pseudocode if that helps. Oh, no, you have nothing to be sorry for, Michael. You were just trying to help, and I have no problem with that. Um, it's just that free conference call won't let that happen. So if you're also curious about the flow charts, they have what is a flow chart, but also, and I don't think enough students use this, you can go out and create a, a free account for Lucid Chart, and it has, let's see, Lucid Chart. It is, you can have, a, let's see, I think you can get a free account on Lucid Chart. No, that's not it. Hi, uh, uh, sorry, I did figure I'd just ask you, um, Fine. For, the, for the assignment, in the pseudocode, you'd mentioned the one line would be process in there uh, for the assignment. I was just wondering how that how that is represented in the pseudocode for the process part. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So a process would just be something like, 
Um, they say that's a bad example. Um, that's a bad example. There's a good example. Um, the process here, it would be open the Brightspace module, or the process would be generate random number. Okay. For the assignment, that will be a process. Generate the random number. You don't have to know what the random number generator is. You don't have to know the Python function. You just have to say generate random number. Okay, so sort of like the previous assignment where it said, you know, calculate. We're yes. just kind of putting an abstract kind of uh, word on it. Okay. Yes. That's all we're doing is we're just putting that word on it. Um, you could also use calculate. Okay. Calculate random number, generate random number. I don't know how strict other professors are. If for me, with my students, calculate, generate, because with pseudocode there is no real true syntax. Um, so you could use the word generate some places and calculate in other places. So um, I, I just don't know what leeway other um, professors give. I give a lot of leeway in the wording because I've written pseudocode before and there aren't a lot of structure to it. So I prefer diagrams. Uh, thank you. I appreciate you uh, going over that. Oh, not a problem. Anybody have any other questions about the assignment or about loops? Okay. I'm going to call it then. Everybody have a wonderful evening. This should be up tomorrow evening and with all of the appropriate links for both uh, the um, flowcharts and the pseudocode as well as all of the, um, yeah the Python code and my brain is freezing. So I'm going to stop the recording.